Guys, welcome back to another election edition of Meet Victoria. Um, this is a special thing we like to do around elections, so you can get to know your candidates, get to know the people that are running for the various offices in town. And before I go on, let me just thank VCS. If you don't know VCS, if you don't know the Hartman family, guys, you're missing out. They will take care of all your communication needs. They hooked my family up. We needed radios. We wanted all these crazy little setups. We called them. They didn't even bat an eye, and more importantly, they didn't even laugh at us, but they took great care of us. They got us fixed up. So thank you so much to VCS. They have kindly, like they do so many other things in this town, they have kindly agreed to sponsor this and all of our candidate interviews. So make sure you go out and support them because they are always supporting our community. So thank you again to VCS. We really do appreciate you. And on that note, today I'm privileged and, and happy to be joined by VISD trustee District 4, for District 4 school board race, Del Zook. And I think I said it right this time. You, you got it, Caleb. Thank uh, you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I appreciate you joining. Um, originally, guys, we were going to have a debate scheduled and, and get that done. Um, and Mr. Zook was, was kind enough to, to be to want to participate, but Mandy Lingle and Dr. De Los Santos were not. So we're going to do this forum here and give him an opportunity since he's willing to talk about his platform. We're going to take it. Um, so on that note, my friend, Tell us a little bit about yourself and what in the world made you want to run for school board. I've thought about this a long, hard. A friend of mine, Emmett Alvarez. God always mentioned you know, we're we're partners in, in investigating a lot of things that happen in government. Uh, but about three years ago, I brought a, a copy of the budget after listening to the school board talking for 45 minutes and passing a 123 million dollar budget. I said. You, you, when you were in the school, when you were inside the city council, did y'all ever pass anything uh, in, in the 45 minutes or less? said, no. Uh, what are you talking about, Dale? I said, I just watched the video on the school board, and they march in the, a $128 million budget and in, four, in a, in a two-page show of the, of the entire budget, and they passed it seven to nothing. I said, that's just not right. What is going on in our representative where our trustees actually can make a decision without ever seeing anything. It's almost like Pelosi who said, well, you don't get to see what's actually in the bill until you pass the bill, mm -hmm. which takes us to another story somewhere down later on in the interview. But anyway, uh, we, we decided to start looking into the budget and looking into the school district and seeing what all was going on. Her, the Hurricane Harvey had just hit a few days, a few days before, and the budget had been passed. and. Uh, the city was in total wreck. Well, we shelved the, the VISD for a little bit, but what ended up coming back is that we started looking at how money was being accumulated by the school district, how money was being spent by the school district, and then comes a thing called the TAPR, the Texas uh, Academic Performance Re and Review, put out by TEA. And the TEA said our school district was in the tanks. So I started figuring up all the, the, the calculations and it wasn't in the tanks because the school district said, well, we're a school district of excellence. But then they are rate, rated as a C. But then we started looking down that the C was only, there was only 189 people, school districts in the state. There's 200, 1,084, I believe, in the entire state. We were like in the 169th from the bottom, which basically tanked, when you did our modern math, came down to the to the 12th percentile in the entire state. Remember that that little statement that used to be said on the on the uh, the scoreboard: 612 miles of excellence. Mm -hmm. We're any, we're, we're anything but excellent, brother. If we're in the bottom 12, and that's where we started thinking about understanding what was making the school district so bad. It has opportunities, especially since we got Mr. Shepard that came in. He's brought in great opportunities and. But we still had to figure out what's making the school district tick, and we need to have a voice in our in our school district because the trustees are the are, are are elected officials to the school district, and if the taxpayers have no direct input into the school district, that leaves us a, and is able basically floating along without any direction of the people that are, who have the biggest stakeholders. Our businesses have to be a stakeholder because. 
eventually these kids who are in the first grade become their employees. And if they don't, the kids don't have a direction in life, they don't have the skills to perform adequately, our businesses suffer. And so that's why I'm running for the school board, is to provide a voice for people like you and me to the school board and ultimately the education of our children. Outstanding. Okay, well, that, that's a great answer, and that kind of leads me into my next question. What is your, what do you see as the role of a school board trustee? And again, who do you believe you answer to, or school board trustees should answer to? Well, if, if it was a trustee directly for the children, I would be, a, I would be saying that I'm, I, I'm taking the place of the parents, and as taking the place of the parents, I'm the only one, like I was appointed by the, by, uh, the, the courts to make that the role, but actually the parents are the one, and the parents are the elect are the ones who elect us. The children haven't elected any of the trustees that I have ever known. Mm -hmm. They are elected by the by their peers, which are also the taxpayers and the owners of the schools. The schools, uh, going all back three, we we the taxpayers pay more than than the state does to running the schools. Mm -hmm. Anytime, as my daddy used to say, son, you see all that grass out there? I said, yes, sir. That grass belongs to me when it's cut. When it needs cutting, it belongs to you. So you need to get out there and mow the grass. And so as a trustee, our job is to, to mow the grass of the school district to make sure that everything is in good shape. And then when, if the grass starts getting too tall or is killed because we didn't take good care of it and, and, the, and the chinch bugs get in, then as a trustee, we need to go back in and say, hey, guys, we got a problem here. This is what we need to do. A trustee needs to understand the, the academic part of it because, as I sit in on a lot of their meetings, the, the, the director of curriculum walks in, the business person walks in, the guys in the, the superintendent of maintenance, he walks in. You've got to have an understanding of all these different areas, and that's one of my strengths. I have been in, in uh, the academics. I have a master's degree in, in, in uh, business and psychology. Not that that means anything. It means I spent too much time going to school. But uh, I am glad to say I, do, I got a degree in, uh, in Texas A&M, the College of Agriculture, and learned a lot of things about maintenance. I've done on properties. I'm constantly out there working on So I, I have a under, good understanding on the maintenance side, but as a financial advisor and working with a lot of folks, including teachers, I have learned how to look at numbers in a different way. One thing, I can, I can be uh, listening to somebody and, uh, and they'll be telling me an answer and I can watch their, their eyes and their body and I can see how that they're reacting to the answer they're giving me. And I can also understand if they're fidgeting, they're not grasping something that I'm talking to. So I, I can make a change in how I'm talking to them. Maybe they, they prefer not oral, but being able to hear by by the way my hands are moving. They can grasp that. So that's, as a trustee, we have to be able to understand all these things that are happening in the school. But also, I believe, more important, we need to know the answer before we ask the question. If you're depending upon someone else's answer, you may or may not get the answer that is the truth. It may be a truth in, of the agenda that they're pushing, whoever, and I'm not saying a school district is pushing an agenda, but we have to understand the whole truth and, and what brought us to that particular truth. Right. Well, no, great answer. And, and you know, kind of speaking on, a, on agendas and stuff, you know, right now everybody, the big giant elephant in the room is the, the VISD bond that, that's out there right now. And, and you know, there's a very focused campaign-like effort on the behalf of on behalf of VISD to to sell this. Say, you know, there's people passing out flyers. They've got websites. They, uh, you know, I know on the last bond they they pulled the 18-year-old seniors out of class, gave them this big important you know speech about the importance of their vote and what the the bond means to school, and then walked them down to a voting booth, which I just think is electioneering, just totally wrong to 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 do something like that to steer, you know. I just think that was, was pretty calculated and underhanded. But going on, what I always hear from VISD is, well, these are the facts of the bond. The, but when I look through there, there's not a lot of facts in there. It's, it's more of a timeshare type presentation that they give. And it, it feels like, hey, you get this free vacation if you go to this timeshare presentation where we're going to present you with all the good facts. And, but you start looking through there, and with that $156.8 or whatever it is, 
There's no hard prices, and this is all just estimates, and you, basically you give us this big old check, and then we're going to find ways to spend it. And, you know, me personally, I am against the bond. I think everybody knows that. Um, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on it? And, and we'll just, we'll go down this road and see where we go with it. Okay. Well, my relationship with VISD officially kind of started when we, they, they, they and I'm, I'll say the, uh, received a phone call from Tammy Keeling. We'd had a long conversation on a trip that I was going up to Colorado. So long trip through the northern part of Texas. And we, Tammy and I talked a lot. And she said, I'd like for you to be participating on a, a, a task force for demographics and, re, and rezoning. And so I agreed to, to do that. And then it, it was, uh, they asked us to participate in what was called the uh, the bond task force. So that's that one actually started like in October of two, ni, two, 2019. I think it was that. It, was, it seems it was a long time ago. Yes, sir. Now. I think you're roughly about right, though. From what but I we started that process, and uh, they, they were. We started off, and, and Greg Bonewell is a great guy. He's, he's, he is quite a facilitator. I'm, I'm impressed with him. If I was going to try to hire somebody to work in my insurance agency, it would definitely be him. He has a way of, of uh, making more complex ideas a little bit easier to understand. That is a skill. It, that it, is a it, skill. It is a skill. So, so but Greg, Greg was in charge of all these facilitations, and then ultimately we, we got into what was called the tax reallocation uh, committee. Uh, it's a long process, but this basically takes you into about uh, about 18 months of, of following the school district. Uh, we we went through the bond, through the through the uh, the boundaries, and they, we shut down three schools or made recommendations to shut down three schools. But every time I'm involved in something, I'm watching to see where the actual recommendations come from. The recommendation wasn't didn't come from the from the task force. It came from the administration. Mm -hmm. And so when we really started a little bit more into the uh, the bond task force, I paid attention to the entire process. And I had my hypothesis where, where we were going with this, and it, it came out to be pretty much the same way. But the, the process started off, here's our need. We have all these facilities, and they, they showed us pictures of, of uh, problems in the school district, air conditioners, uh, and then we, and showing us the age of the buildings, you know, like the age of the buildings means something in Victoria. Well, they're all 50 years or older. Uh, so is oh, my house. Uh, most probably at least th three fifths of Victoria is 50 years and older, and we're not. Our our houses aren't failing; they're not falling apart by and large. Mm -hmm. Even on this, on this more southern part of Victoria, the oldest part of Victoria, our houses are not falling apart. And these guys are 110, 120 years old, 90 years old. If you're in, around De Leon Street and down on C Avenue, they're old, but. As owners of the houses, or even they're taking care of the property, and we, the CAD value keeps going up because the houses are taken care of. But they're they're at they come to us as, as the bond task force. That these buildings are old; they're 50 years old. See, this one's 50. That one's 40. That one's 30. Oh, and that's where we were coming down. At. And where are we going with this? I was thinking. Well, three months later, they brought in a, a group, uh, introduced a company called Huckabee Architects. Huckabee Architects is part of the uh, TASB, Texas Association of School Boards. It's a um, it's a not considered to be a nonprofit, but they seem to be the driving force behind the think tanks of what is school boards. They they uh, provide the continuing education. You have to have this continuation. Uh, uh, in order to serve on the school board. So uh, it'd be like the lights we have here. When I walked in, Caleb, I was kind of concerned. And it looks, looked like something out of uh, Stalag 13. <laughs> and, and basically what I have seen from guys who've come out, they're indoctrinated in, in school culture, school mm -hmm. tank. But I'm diverging. When Huckabee came in, they, they said, well, we've walked through a, a million square feet of the school district, and these are the problems that we have. It's $138 million of needs. And, uh, and they start going through the air conditioning. They showed pictures of, of uh, natural gas lines that are, that are rusted and corroding, and pictures of air conditioners that are rusted and falling apart, and water dripping from the, from the ceilings. 
and uh, electrical outlets that are overloaded. And I started thinking, you know, and then they come back to this, all the buildings are old. They need, some of them need to be replaced because they're old. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, I think back to my rent houses and my ho all my houses are older than, than Caleb. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there's some of them, one of them 70, a couple of them are 61. My youngest one is 55 years old. But we, my wife and I, we, our idea has always been we're going to have rentals, but at the minute, at any moment, we can, we'd be proud to move into any of our houses because we're taken care of. Yes, sir. The school district has not been taking care of its facilities, and that's where the problem is. And a guy by the name of Mike Severin, I believe his name is, I butchered his name, it's, it, yeah, but anyway, he, he's bringing up all this information, and I said, Mike, can you explain something to me? He said, yes, sir. What caused all this problem? Well, he looked at me like a deer in a headlight, uh, Caleb, and he looked back behind me, and I knew who was standing behind me, and, and he looked again at the guy to the left of me, and I knew he was another administrator. And finally, I asked him, what caused these problems? And he finally said, deferred maintenance. I knew what that meant. And I said, we explained deferred maintenance. And once again, he's looking back at these administrators. So I answer this question. And they, finally, the answer comes out. And he says, sheepishly, we, dis, dis, we de decided to not to maintain this property at this particular time. Mm -hmm. And those were the words. We deferred maintaining them. And so I went and talked to a couple more school, former school board members said, that's always been the case, Dale. We choose not to, and we'll go out and borrow money and, and, uh, to fix the facilities because we don't need to make the hard decisions, which comes back to why am I running? We have to make the hard decisions because the old, cause when we, the taxpayers, you and me, you and I who are, who are talk, thinking about this bond at this moment, we're, we take care of our facilities. Why can't with $128 million in a school board uh, budget they never look at, why can't they take care of their facilities? They said, well, you go back and look at their, at their, the, uh, the, um, the budget, which I've got right there. It's a three-inch binder. I brought it on just in case you ask me a yes, tough sir. question. Yes, sir. But I've, I've thumbnailed through this entire thing it's to the point my thumbnails are now are, are dog-eared, and there's money in this budget. So just because they chose over the last 12 years to pay $9 million, $8 million, not $10 million. It wasn't until the hurricane blew through that they, they got to over $12.5 million and, and $14 million for, for repairs that they started to maintain the buildings. But it's easier to have a new building because you're thinking that it's not going to cost as much money. So we're not putting as much money in our, in our buildings, well, which is not the case. Let's look at the bond issue for Stroman. Strowman is going to cost right at $73, $78 million. And we were specifically told, and that when we as the taxpayers, if you're listening in the video of the, of the school board, I think on the 27th of January, I think it was, and, he, and the superintendent said, we really won't know the actual cost until we pass the bond. Because one of the trustees had asked, go back. I think it was the 27th. It may have been the, the 15th or 17th, but it happened in January. Go back and look, and you'll hear that exact word. You will not know the cost until the bond is passed. Well, how did we come up with these numbers? Well, after the, 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 the deferred maintenance answer by Huckabee, they started going through the process again, and, and two meetings later, which I think happened like on the, this meeting happened on the 27th of October of 2020. The, some they they the question was asked when do we replace a building and uh it came from the audience i think it came from a huckabee person but it may come from a school district person because we had a third of the people in, on the task force were from the school district someone asked them, when do we re when do we just replace a building instead of trying to maintain it and immediately uh mike pops up and says when a facility costs 50 percent or more of the maintenance to replace it. 50% was the answer. And they said, well, which ones would that be? And they came down a list of five schools. Immediately, the answer was there, which told me this whole thing has been in a fix. This is no more a task force than it is a task farce. Mm -hmm. I was, I, we always, 
Emmett and I, he refused to play, play games anymore with the second reopening when we went on Zoom. But Emmett said, I'm not going to participate. I know what this is all about. I said, well, I'm going to because you know, they asked me to. We're going to just follow through and see what it is. But no, they, when you have the answer to a question and it appears that the question was pre-prepared, pre uh -huh. this is a setup. And so that's that. I think that answers where it, it, it does. And I'll, I'll tell you, I was. But I have one other little piece yes, sir. of the puzzle. And this is an important part. In 2008, we did the original bond, okay, for the high schools. It was $148 million. There, we, in one of the slides, they, they go in and showing how much it's going to cost. They said it's only going to cost us seven and a half more cents. Go back, and it shows the first $100 million of this bond package is free. There, it's already taken care of in the inside of the tax, in the, the, I and S uh, fund, which is the interest and sinking that pays for these bonds. They, it was already inside there. So I went back and looking, and from starting in 2018, we have been overtaxed by four and a half million dollars every year, which takes us back to 2018 when they did, they, they did what was called a defeasance. And basically, they had almost a $17 million inside of the I and S fund. And they had to get this money out because even I asked them, you can't have this much money inside your INS fund. Well, what had happened is that when they de when they went and refinanced the bond in 2018, what happened is that their interest rate went way down, but they kept the, the rate at 22.35. 22.35 is the cents that they, that we pay. I know this is getting really boring, guys, but hang with me just a little bit longer. When they refinanced, the interest rate dropped, which is a good thing for us. But they kept that interest that interest number coming in. So now they're right back up to $14 million. We're in the exact same place. Go back to January 27th when there was a, a board meeting. And Ms. Koch who said, we are, we've made 100% attainment. We're in perfect standing with the state guidelines because we have only 54 to 63% of, of too much money in the INS fund. Well, we're now at 200 percent. And can, Ms. Koch then said that, remember, though this number is from 2018. She already knew that she was no longer in the preferred number. She was way above the number. So what goes on? Well, basically now, here's the meat and potatoes. The idea is, is that they knew they could not pass a 20 cent bond. That's how much this thing is going to cost us to pay for 100 and and six, $58 million, it's going to take 20 cents. When we, right now, we're at 7% too much. You're rolling down interest a little bit more. The actual cost of the bond is 12, is 12 cents today. Ten, it's a 10 cent spread. Guys, they're overtaxing us, and that is why this is such a low costing bond, because it's only 7.5 cents. It's actually in. When they refinance, another two cents. They're going to save on additional because they're dropping from four to two and a half percent. And when you add your seven and a half, it's a 20 cent bond. If we came to you and said, guys, it's, we're going to have to raise your taxes by 20 cents, what are you going to say? How much does that equal, Dale? Well, it equals about $400 a year. That's not $100. No, it's not. And that's the dirty secret. We, 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 if we as trustees can fool the people for little things, what are they fooling us for the big things? Ac academics, where we're in the bottom 12%? Or maybe where we say our teachers are in such great shape and they're in the bottom 27% of the state. And when we lose a good teacher from East and we have to replace them with a brand new teacher, who suffers? No. It's, school, it's our children who suffer, and ultimately our business community, because our business community depends upon our students to know how to add, subtract, and multiply, and speak the English language coherently. And those are the problems we have in VISD. We can't really trust the school trustees because they're trustees for the children, but they're not trustees for the children, or we wouldn't be in the, the bottom 12% of the state in, in our academic achievements. Agree. Yes, sir. Well, a lot to unpack there. First and, and, and foremost, going back to the beginning of your statement with the, the maintenance stuff, I can, I can second that with over the course of the last bond and even this bond, 
most of the information I get is from teachers that are out there, and, and, and I'm told the very same thing. These issues were created from deferred maintenance. These issues were created from them choosing not to do a lot of these repairs, and then to take it further, as the different bond things approaches, hey, don't fix that right now. Let it, you know, we need to show how bad this is for the pictures, for the bond, et cetera. And so that's what I've been told by, you know, and, and sadly, most of them, they all want to remain anonymous because they, they fear retribution. But it's been teachers that are telling me this, that it's the deferred maintenance that, that's keeping them there. Um, and then, you know, regarding the, the bond task force, I agree. I got that phone call as well, and, and it had a weird s smell to it when I got it. The, the, it didn't feel right, and because I, I felt that it was going to be, they have a predetermined outcome that they want, and they're going to try to stack the people with their dissenters or people that question them, and then turn around and say, well, these people, the, these are the very people that came up with this bond, and, and when the answer was already determined, and I'll tell you what kind of confirmed that to me is, I was watching one of these school board meetings, and I was... I was watching them all just talk about how they were just blown away by the 100% unanimous vote from the task bond, from the bond task force of this is it, this is what we need. And, and I remember thinking, I'm pretty sure Dell's on that thing, and I'm pretty sure he's not up. And, and they just kept hammering, and we have it. It's 100% unanimous. Everybody on the task force agrees. No, 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 no they, a year ago, they went and created a thing because they knew that there was going to be two, him and me, uh -huh. who would be against anything. They say, well, that's not true. Right. We both agree that we need a bond to fix some stuff because we have failed the community in maintaining it as we go. With mm -hmm. $128 million, not enough money. But they, but the administration created, but we're going to have a consensus. It'll be a consensus, which is unanimous, plus or minus two or three or four. Mm -hmm. No, there was four that of us who said no. And, but it came within, but originally the consensus was two. Somehow, they, when they counted the noses, it was four, and, we, and the consensus number shifted from two to four. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that wasn't unanimous. But, hey, I agree there needs to be a bond. I'm in favor of a bond. It's just not this bond. Right. I believe that the schools need to be maintained, preferably on an as-we-go basis. And with $128 million, if you can't go in as a trustee and find the money just in the fat, and I know there's a lot of fat in there. My book shows there's a mm -hmm. lot of fat inside there. Mm -hmm. there's, if we can't go in and make the hard decisions as trustees for the taxpayers and the stakeholders, which are the businessmen who are paying the most egregious, what, what is uh, DuPont is doing? They're, they're paying a huge amount of our money. They just fork it over. They don't have a say-so in it. But they do have the say-so in that, are they going to hire our kids to go work as operators over at, uh, at the old DuPont plant? The chances are not without some, a lot of training. But our kids are, are the ones who are suffering. So we are the trustees, they, they say. But we're, our idea of who we're trusting for is maybe not the exact same answer. Got it. So what about so that... That overtaxation that is happening, has it stopped? And if not, what do we do? As you know, what is our recourse? What do we do if, if we're being overtaxed by the school board? What options or, or recourse do we, as a taxpayer, have to to stop that overtaxation or to hold somebody accountable for overtaxing us for all these years? Because I know we won't be written a check, and and you know, and and I know VISD. You know, I know after they went in and they grabbed that money after Harvey. You mean the you know, eleven cents? Yeah, they, and it, you know, we 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 don't know if we're going to get our FEMA money back. So so we have to do this against the will of the people. We have to do this theft from the community when they're down the the most. And this is my opinion of it, and, okay. and that I I'm share not, with I'm not of, using the word theft. Yes, sir, and and understood. But I am. I think it was theft because when you know on the bond they had roughly about forty percent approval in the community. For that, that tax grab, that 11 cent, they had none, none. I don't know a single person. That, I mean, and that meeting was packed, and they knew it, and everybody got the fill afterwards that the, it was, the outcome was already decided before they ever walked in and had to go through the formality of dealing with the public to, to do what they wanted. Right. And the excuse given was that FEMA, they didn't know if they were going to get their FEMA money. And I remember Tammy King, we have an obligation to make ourselves whole. And my question was, was it what expense and whose expense, you know? And, 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 and then when they turned around and they got their FEMA money before the tax grab happened, you know, I went back and said, hey, 
are you gonna, why don't you stop that tax? You got your FEMA money. This was the reason you told us you needed it. Are you gonna stop it? Well, no, but we'll be good stewards with your money and we're gonna go ahead and take it anyway. And that's why I use the word theft because I think if you take one cent more from the taxpayer than you absolutely have to, then it's theft. And their reason of, again, we have to do this for, we make ourselves whole because we don't know if we're getting our FEMA money. And then they got it and they took it anyway. To me, that's, that's theft, but you know, Moving on here with the the well, you do know where that uh, that five and a half million dollars is, don't you? Mm -mm. What do you think they did with that five and a half money? Come give us a good give us your example. Of I would study. think they spent it somewhere, but that would you just are be absolutely me. wrong. That would be my call. No, it's sitting inside there inside of the uh, bond. Fund, I mean, not bond fund. Excuse me, in the general operations surplus account. They never spent a penny of it. They went up. Actually, they made money on the hurricane because we went up almost. Eight and a half million dollars from 13 million to 22 million dollars. It's in the number, I forget exact number. But the, the, they sat on that, that 11 cents, five and a half million dollars, and it went up. And it's still sitting to this day inside of the, inside their, call it their 401k. They took from your 401k, put it into their 401k, and it's now it's growing interest. So with, all the, time. so with all this, basically, lack of better terms, fraud, waste, and abuse going on, yeah. I have a hard time as a taxpayer justifying giving them more money. You know, and, and I watch people like Vic Morgan in his presentation to the school board call everybody that's against the tax hike stupid. You know, and, and well, I don't understand why they're not smart enough to save money up every month to, to pay this. Well, maybe because we shouldn't be having to pay this if, if they took care of their obligations and they handled their money and they were truly good stewards of it. And I think that's where the frustration lies is I keep getting told to give up a glass of, give up my cup of Starbucks this month or give up so some kid can have a, and you know, and then I look at the tremendous amount of the, the playing with numbers and the moving of this and, and all that. And, you know, somehow I'm made out to be a villain for questioning things or, or wanting accountability there. And, and and from their ivory towers, you know, they look down with their pinky out and, well, I just don't know why they're not smart enough to set money aside. Whenever I lived in a house that wasn't given to me by university housing, I didn't question the tax rate. Well, I'm sorry, that's on you for not questioning the tax rate. You should have. That makes you sound ignorant, not the people that are questioning it, you know. And, and I, this whole bond, it, it reeks of a feeling of establishment and, and the well-to-dos and entitlements yeah. that... You little, little peons just need to shut up right. and, and pay, give up your glasses, start. And they always use the, well, on a $100,000 house, well, you know, I think the median price of a house in Victoria right now is somewhere around like 205, 210, yeah. you know, and, and they know that. And, and so, and they, they talk about, well, $7 a month. Well, that's $7 a month on top of how much already that these people are paying. You know, most people are paying several thousand dollars a year to VISD alone, who takes double almost what the city, the next taxing entity under them, the city gets less than, almost less than half of what VISD does, and it's never enough. And the solution always, hey, we need more money, more money. And I'm over here yelling more accountability and, and you know, because you went through so many of these different things, teacher pay, school rankings. And I think there's a, a, a miscue there where if you're against just blowing money hand over fist and building all these buildings that you're somehow against the students and the teachers and, and all of that, and, and I don't think it could be further from the truth. I. I, I think we have amazing teachers in town, and, and you know, for those that wonder, th this is not something going after teachers or students or trying to keep, you know, me just be able to have an extra cup of Starbucks. I think that the students included are better served when there's accountability and, and there's, and we see where our dollars are going and that waste and abuse of our funds is minimized because in our homes, we have to pull in our belt. They take this money. And if we don't pay it, we lose our homes. Right. And and I watched Mr. Morgan talk about, you know, I don't see why they get so upset because this is, you know, it's less than the sales tax or, or some example like that. Well, if I choose to not go out and buy something and have to pay a sales tax, nobody shows up and, and kicks me out of my home or where I lay down and sleep at night. But they will if I don't pay my taxes, you know, my school mm -hmm. taxes. And, and, and so, you know, what do we do to to, you know, help the teachers. You know, the, the biggest thing I hear from the community is everybody wants our teachers paid more. We all agree on that. But how do we do it when so much money is being siphoned to all these other ridiculous places, sitting in bank accounts, doing all these other things? How do we take care of our teachers and, and give them the raises that so many of them deserve? 
This is where I and uh, five of the other uh, trustees completely disagree. They approved the uh, the pay scale that I've been publishing on on my website page and on the Facebook. They paid approved this, and basically it's just between forty six and fifty eight, forty six million, forty six thousand dollars and fifty six thousand dollars. If I got my numbers right, there's a ten thousand spread between a brand new teacher and a twenty five thirty year teacher. We know. Especially in the real, how many years does it take if you bring in a new realtor? Does it take before they really become profitable, become a good realtor? How many Shaw years? Realty is almost uh, almost immediately, but in a normal world, in a normal it realty, takes, it takes time. Yes, sir. They've Give got a, a couple, couple years, couple, you know, five. before they really hit their stride. And, and absolutely, you know, you yeah. you build and you get better, but it takes kind of years, years to get your system down. It's the down same and all thing that. with a teacher. A teacher comes out of the school full of of promise, but it takes. Generally, four to five, sometimes six years for that teacher to become a very profitable teacher, and that's at that particular point in time. That's when our pay scale tops off, and you're not getting any bigger. Most school districts at that fifth and sixth, seventh year, that's when they start hitting the stride in paying their teachers more money, and that's where we come in. We don't need. I, we do not need this bond. We need a smaller bond, which goes back to the original numbers that Huckabee showed us. Between 40 and $50 million is all we need to fix our air conditioners, fix our roofs, fix the electrical. But I even hear the Title I numbers that are possibly coming down. It's a friend up in Washington uh, that, that works in one of the uh, Department of Education, I think. There's gonna, there is the potential of Title I monies coming in to fix our infrastructure for electrical need for the computers and fixing and providing Wi-Fi and te technical information, technical supplies for our schools. So theoretically, with the, the existing money that we're being overtaxed, ten, which is 10 cents, we have enough money for that 5 cents could replace our oldest school, which is uh, Mission Valley. Mm -hmm. It could also provide uh, the, the 50 uh, bond money to pay for the roof, the air conditioners, the it replaces electrical and work on the plumbing. We can get our facilities back into shape with five cents. That would leave five more cents available for pay raises for teachers and for those teachers that are that our numbers, our plans come up with. It, if you are, have six years or more experience, we're looking at $5,000 pay raise for each teacher. That would go a long way to stop the loss of our teachers. As the administration told me one time on the bus going from one high school to an, I mean one school to another. Once we lose an experienced teacher, we cannot replace them with our pay scale. We know that is the case. We cannot replace them. So when a chemistry teacher or a math teacher with 20 years leaves uh, east or west, they're not being replaced except for by a first year teacher. And it takes five years at least to be able to grab see how this that student is able to grasp that information if they're under in, able to in, put it into their test scores or that the teacher has to change the way they're teaching. We've got to keep our best teachers and we have to be able to have a big enough salary to recruit from outside of Victoria to replace ones that retire. And we can do that without a tax increase. And there's enough, and then after we, we uh, and this is, and what the beauty of it is, I, I'm a Republican, mm -hmm. okay? I'm not, they ever said, don't, don't, don't say that you're a conservative Republican. This is non partial. No. No. I am a Republican. Absolutely. A conservative. I am a Ron Paul type Republican because I don't say no, because I understand the numbers. Yes, sir. And I am a numbers guy, just like Ron Paul is a numbers guy. Yes, we have to have someone in there that understands the numbers, is smart enough to ask the question, but smarter to know when, he's, when the answer he's being given is not the right answer. Yes, sir. No, I think it is important to know kind of your ideology and affiliation because, you know, it's the same thing with city council. You know, we're told, don't ask that, that they're, they're your friends, they're your community members, that's who you're... Well, you kind of need to know where people align because when these big decisions always come down locally, the same that you face on the state level, the federal level, all that, you have to make those people will be making the decisions and you know I would argue Victoria is about a 65 60 65 percent conservative city 68 percent there you go 68 percent and yet our school board our EDC our city council our chamber of commerce all of these positions of authority and taxing entities and what have you 
are all staffed with left-leaning people in a right-leaning town. And I think a lot of the results of what we see in policy and decisions making is just that. And and, and kind of, you know, we're going to, I'm going to kind of rapid fire with you here to, to, since we're getting long on time, but one of the things I heard, which was from a third party, and so I, I haven't independently verified this, but while I got you sitting here, you know, I was told that on Stroman it would cost roughly about $40 million to remodel it, fix it up, do what you got to do, versus $70 million to, to build a new one. And my buddy, you know, asked the question, well, then why don't we, you know, why don't we, they, they were selling it as, hey, it's going to cost $40 million, but we can get a whole new one for $70 million and not have to, and his thought was, why not do the 40 million, remodel it, fix everything, and save 30 million? And they said they just looked at him, and, and that wasn't what they wanted to, the to hear. And, and so I kind of wanted to ask: is, is there any truth to that that you're aware of that the repair cost is about 40 million, yet we're choosing 70 million to tear it down, or is that just kind of a little bit of hearsay? Uh, I'll go back to the the tape cut. We won't know the answer until it's passed. Good point. Okay. And, and I'll repeat the thing: if you can't trust your leaders in small things, how do we trust our leaders in big things? Here's a th something from the from the realtor I heard from one of my friends who talked to one of the realtors at this last meeting that they had, and, and I take it as a compliment. Uh, I and my opponent are, are salt and pepper, mm -hmm. but the difference between Mr. Zook, he'll look you in the eye and tell you exactly what he thinks, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm going to do. When you ask me a question, I will look you in the eye. I will tell you exactly what I think. I will listen to what you say, and I, and I am not in concrete, but if the numbers work for us and your, your belief in what you're saying is true, I'm going to listen and, I'm going to, and I will take my march north and say, yes, sir, I believe you are absolutely correct. I'm not so egotistical that I think I'm always correct because I'm not. <laughs> well, you were willing to step up and answer the, the questions when your opponent, won and opponent wasn't. So right out the gate, you, you get some respect from me there on that. Let me give you, I got a few questions I kind of want to fire through. Try to keep your answers short okay. on these. I'm just going to, and I know they can, can lead out to longer ones, but we'll try to just for the sake, sake, of, sake of brevity, um, be kind of quick on these. Um, COVID policies, remote learning, all this stuff going on, and do you see, where do you kind of sit on the, the whole COVID stuff? Me personally, I would like to see a return to normal, where the students get to be students, we, we, we get back there, and I understand, listen to the science, blah, 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 um, but that said, you know, my understanding is the data basically says schools are a pretty safe spot and, and all of that, and I... I would like to see the students get to start living a normal life again and, and get their desk back to work, take the mask off, do the whole thing. That's my personal uh, opinion on it. Where do you stand as far as COVID policies, remote learning? Should they have the option? Does everybody just need to get back in school, we return to normal? Where do you sit on that? Children learn best in a social environment. Children are just learning how to become social animals. I mean, bad word. No, I understand, social though. beings is the right word. Social Learning to be social beings at age 6, 7, 8, 10. We, our children have to be in, in an area that feels safe. Schools are safe. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have to be in a, in a with a good a good teacher, and that's what we're striving for. Better pay for our teachers. We need to get away from this COVID stuff because for the only one that's deadly for us people old like me and, and older. Yes, sir. For young people like you and the children, it's not. And all it's doing is it's that our, when we get our star test back, I bet you we're going to be a years behind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, good, good answer. Trade school options. I'm a big believer in, you know, college doesn't have to be the only route. I, you know, we, we see every day in my industry where we have a lack of good plumbers, a lack of good roofers, a lack of good HVAC guys, electric, you know, these are strong career fields where people are making 75 to to $100 an hour. Yet a lot of times if you say, hey, I'm going to go to this school or that, Instead of college, you're mocked or you're laughed at. Well, that guy gets out and you know, and he's making ninety dollars an hour versus the other person's, you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars in debt and looking for a job. And and do you like trade schools being as something that VISD working to prepare students as an alternative to college if they choose not to do college to do some of these trade programs, yeah, et cetera? When I, when I was in high school back in the seventies, we had a a school right on. I think it was on. Uh, Locust Street that was built by the vocational education. They did everything from the plumbing to the sewer to the electrical and, and the house stands today. I'm sorry it's old. It's 50, 60 years old. Got it. Okay. No, I no agree. we need vocational education. Uh, Brett Baldwin's been a phenomenal uh, 
advocate for vocational education. Yes, sir. Yeah, he's done a great job on that. He really has. Um, Politics invading our schools, woke agendas. You know, I I, I saw a letter the, the superintendent sent out last year, I believe, or maybe it was early this year, acknowledging his white privilege and, and promising to bring the diversity and, and social justice type training to, to the school and to the students to kind of help them overcome their implicit biases and, and all that, or their unconscious biases and, and all that. And I personally just, I, I reject that line of thinking. I, I don't think that high schools are the place where we need to be indoctrinating these students into a very politically charged environment of, of you know, privilege and some people have it, some don't, blah, 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 blah. Um, what are your thoughts on, you know, and, and we see around the country different schools, curriculums changing and, and different states trying to almost have revisions of history and, and their narrative of the, the historical events taught in schools instead of uh, traditional type teachings. Where do you stand as far as, you know, down the road, current, you know, what roles should, if any, our schools have in all these political things and these woke agendas and, and all of this stuff, you know, where, as a parent, that would concern me that my child would be hearing some of this. And if they're going to get that whole speech about their privilege and, and, and because of their whiteness or whatever it is, then I think everything, you know, if you're going to open that can, you need to open every other can. And I just think that those are cans that don't necessarily need to be open in high school. They need to be learning. You know, they can, they can take on their activism later, in my humble opinion. High school is not the place. Not that we want to silence their voice, but I would argue 16 and 17 year olds don't know their voice yet because I'm 42 and I'm still grow, trying to figure out what I want to do when I grow up. So um, that was a long, you know, long question. Um, but politics in our school, ideology, stuff like that. What do, should schools be safe from that or part of it? Math, history, English, maybe some football if they want to play. That's what our that's what our schools are there, and from. June from uh, elementary school all the way to high school, math, English, teach the kids how to function. And if we can give them a vocational education, great. I'm going to, I'm not, not going getting on this thing to, to spend uh, an hour every couple of weeks on a school board. Unfortunately, they're going to know who I am. I'm a representative of the taxpayers. When our taxpayers talk, Dale Zook is going to look him in the eye and say, yes, ma'am, no, sir. I understand. And that's, there, there is no room for politics inside of our school, and especially liberal politics. When we start voting for Joe Biden at, at 68%, I'll say, yes, sir, we, there's, there is. But right now, we're not. Yes, sir. And that's the way I am. I think you ended that perfectly, and, and I could not agree more with that answer. And so... Again, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being available. Um, you know, it, to me, it speaks volumes that you were willing to come in here and answer all the tough questions, all the questions, and, and make yourself available when your opponent wasn't. And so thank you so much for that. Um, I give a telephone uh, number. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Give, give all your, credit, your credentials. Don't email me. My name is Dale Zook, 361-564-6002. I will answer every phone call. I will answer every question. I am an open book. And I will t look you in the eye and tell you exactly what I think. There ain't no heat. There is no uh, surprises in me. Roger that. Well, sir, we appreciate you. Thank you for coming on. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. Um, we're grateful to all the candidates that have taken the time out and were willing to, to do this when some of them weren't. Thank you again to VCS. They, I, I just don't have enough words for them. They are family friends. They are community friends. They are just awesome people that would love to fix you up on any of your communication needs, from cell phones to radios to just, you. if you can think of it, they can probably do it. So, again, guys, thank you so much. This is Dell Zook from BISD Trustee District 4 School Board Race. Um, go out and support your candidate, and thank you for tuning in. We'll see you at the next one.